Okay, so last time we learned something crucial for the rest of the course, namely Gauss curvature, principal curvature, curvatures, principal directions, and principal curvature, of course, I mean curvature, okay? So the point was improving what kind of differentiable functions, if they are differentiable and where they are differentiable, we learned also an, uh, the, the way to compute them in terms of a local chart. So if around the point you have a parameterization of your regular surface, now you have very simple formula. Well, some are very simple and some are less simple, but I mean, in principle, looking at your nodes, you are able to compute k, h, in terms of the components of the first and the second fundamental form. Okay, so if you have a local chart, if you have x, so that's kind of the strategy you have to keep in mind. You have a local parameterization of your regular surface, so around the point covered by this, uh, by this chart, you can compute capital E, capital F, and capital G immediately, and now I'll show you in the two examples. Now, and then you compute also little, so the, comp the components of the first fundamental form, the components of the second fundamental form. Out of this, you construct immediately K, remember, EG minus F squared over EG minus F squared, and H, which is more complicated. I mean, it's 1 half EG plus G minus 2 FF over EG minus F squared. And then out of this, you compute KI, K1 and K2, which are nothing but H plus or minus H squared minus K. Okay? So that's the strategy. If you need to know the, 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 the curvatures, all these curvatures for a surface, the only point is to be able to parameterize locally around some point with a given chart. So let's see this procedure in practice, how it works. And you will see it's very simple. Okay, so for example, so example one, let's take one of our standard, I mean, we did some examples already, the, 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 the sphere, the plane, and so on. But let's, for example, suppose we take the, the elliptic paraboloid one elliptic paraboloid. So for example, the set of x, y, z in R3, such that it satisfies the quadratic equation, it came up already. We used already this example somewhere, OK? So this is called the elliptic paraboloid. Well, maybe it's a good idea to try to imagine first how it looks like. Usually, the way to do it with, uh, so actually, yeah, now I remember where we used. We proved that this was a regular surface by checking that 0 is a regular value of the function x squared plus y squared minus 2z, because this is the inverse image of 0. Okay? So we know it's a regular surface. In fact, it's also a graph. If you want, you can put this 2 down here. And this shows you immediately it's a graph of something. Okay? So it's that's also another way. And now we will use it to, pro to parameterize it. Um, what I was saying. How, how does it look like? Well, the standard way, I mean, the simplest way for this kind of, of locus to, to understand is to cut with planes, okay, and see what kind of curve you get. Of course, if you ge generically, if you cut a surface with a plane, you get a curve. So depend, if you are able to, to detect which curve is it when the plane is moving, you understand how the surface looks like, okay? Well, of course, in this case, it's simple because if I cut with planes, so I have, I have R3, and if I pick the planes, the horizontal planes, z equal to a constant. Well, of course, for example, if z is equal to 0, I get a point, the origin. Okay, so the, the, the intersection with the uh, coordinate plane z equal to 0 is just the origin. Then if z moves down, becomes negative, the intersection with the plane becomes empty. So there is nothing below the horizontal plane at height 0. What is above? Well, if z becomes 
1. It becomes what? It becomes a circle. If z becomes 2, it's another circle. And the radius of this, I mean, the center of the circles lie on the z-axis. And the radii, of course, are proportional. I mean, besides these two, uh, are proportional to the point z. OK, so it's a growing family of circles. OK, so this tells us how it looks when I cut with horizontal planes. What if I cut with another plane? For example, x equal to a constant, or y equal to a constant. Of course, this is symmetric in x and y. I get a parabola, which, here, of course, you know how to draw it. And at the end, of course, you know, you, you realize that the surface looks like this, OK? Like this, if you want a better picture, OK? This is called the elliptic paraboloid, OK? Now, well, this is one elliptic paraboloid, OK? So let's, let's see them, our machine at work. Well, are we able to find around a point? So I fix now a point, and I would like to know Gauss curvature, mean curvature, and, par and principal curvatures. Well, I need to parameterize locally. I should find a local chart parameterizing a neighbor of this point. But actually, in this case, it's simple. Because this is globally, so there is one chart which covers everything, which is just the graph, the graph chart in some sense, OK? x of uv, where u and v are free to move over the whole r2, so our domain u is equal to r2. And this is equal to u, v, u squared plus v squared, because z is equal to u squared plus v squared over 2. Okay? And this works for every point. Very well. So let's, let's do everything. Let's compute first the big letters. The big letters are what? Are the coefficients of the first fundamental form. Now, remember the coefficients of the first, the entries in some sense of the they are usually called the coefficients, but it's kind of misleading at, in this moment. Why? So the entries of the first fundamental form. So capital E is what? Is xu scalar product xu, and so on. So now you realize immediately, if you imagine what kind of computations I have to do, that it's better first to compute xu, xv, xuu, xuv, xvv, OK, before even thinking. So you switch your brain off, and you start writing xu. xu is 1, 0, u. xv is 0, 1, v. Then of course, well, OK, then you write. As I said, our brain now is switched off, so xuu. xuu is 0, 0, 1. xuv is 0, 0, 0. xvv is 0, uh, 0, 1. And then what? Then I know, I already imagined what kind of computations I have to do. I need to compute the normal, a unitary normal vector field. So I pick the standard one. Remember, there are two. OK, so this is a moment where there is no one answer. I pick n to be xu wedge xv divided by its norm. OK, so let's compute it. So this is, these are the vectors 1, 0, u, and 0, 1, v. So what kind of vector is this? OK. So this is the wedge product, and then I have to divide by its norm. So this is minus u minus v1 divided by its norm, which is square root of 1 plus u squared plus v squared. OK? Now, OK, now we can switch on the brain. We have on the blackboard every ingredient. How do we mix them? Well, capital E is xu scalar product xu by definition. So it's 1 plus u squared. f is xu scalar xv. So it's uv. 
and g is 1 plus v squared. Okay? Now, how much is little e? Little e is the entry of the second fundamental form. Okay, so in this case, let me rewrite what it, what it was the definition. The definition was it's minus dn xu scalar product xu. Okay, but now instead of this, remember we proved a little, we have a little observation. That this is equal to n x u u. N. And now you see why this formula looks a little bit better not to have to take derivatives of this. Okay? It's just a technical thing. Of course, they are the same. So, but here, I, it's less likely to make mistakes. Okay? So how much is it? Well, I have to take N uh, scalar product x u u. So it becomes 1 over the square root. Okay, so what is little f? Little f, uh, I use the same trick, and I find out that this is n x u v. Okay, so n is that one, x u v is here, zero. And what is little g? Little g is n scalar x v v. So it's the same as before, it's one over the square root. Okay, so now you have everything, and you pick the formula, and you find what? <clears throat> that k, now if you want just to be careful, k at which point? Well, k at the point x of uv, so if I fix uv on the domain, I, I'm looking at the point x of uv on the surface, and I'm computing the Gauss curvature at this point. Okay, so k of x u v is given by this formula. Okay, so it's e g. So that becomes 1 over this without the square root. Okay, minus f squared, but this is 0. So this becomes, the, the numerator actually now becomes a, a denominator, but it's, okay. Divided times 1 over e g minus f squared. Okay, e g minus f squared is this one. It's one. So let's let's compute here e g minus f squared, which is something which appears everywhere. Okay, so let's compute it on a side. So this becomes one plus u squared times one plus v squared minus u squared v squared. And this is what. This becomes 1 plus v squared plus u squared plus u squared v squared minus u squared v squared. So that's it. So that's again the same thing. So let, I write it just for once. But then, of course, this becomes 1 over 1 plus u squared plus v squared. Everything squared. OK? And that's for the Gauss curvature. Well, now you pick a, the formula for H. OK, let's not waste 10 minutes. You have everything here. You substitute and you get something. I can tell you, I mean, H, H at the point of x, u, v, at the end of the substitution will be just 1 half. And then it's 2 plus u squared plus v squared over 1, 1 plus u squared plus v squared at the power 3 over 2. <clears throat> OK. Well, is there anything we can draw out of this computation, uh, any conclusion we can draw out of this computation? Well, for example, these, these functions are non-constants. But, for example, k, and in fact even h, both, 
are strictly positive, for example, if you want just to observe something. Okay? So you can say in the language we are building that the elliptic paraboloid is all made of elliptic points, fortunately. Otherwise, the name was kind of very unlucky. Okay? If the elliptic paraboloid had hyperbolic points, it would have been a, a, a language crisis. Okay? Every point is elliptic, for example. Just one conclusion. Okay, let's make another example. Well, much more difficult is to draw any conclusion out of the sign of the mean curvature. In fact, the sign of the mean curvature is not a geometric thing because we have already observed that if I, if I had picked the opposite n, this would have changed sign. So the fact that it is positive is just an accident of my choice. Okay? If you had picked minus n, you would have gotten minus h, so it would have been negative. So maybe the only thing which is geometrically interesting is that this is never zero. So that's the only thing which is invariant by the freedom of choosing n. OK. Let's build another important example. Well, I mean, this is not particularly important. It's just one example. But now the next one is a famous surface, and sooner or later you have to be exposed to that. In any way, the, the point of this computer is to show you how easy they are. Okay, so now do 10 exercises, and then everything will become quick and automatic. Okay. Example two. Well, this is a famous surface, which is called, it has a name called the helicoid. What kind of surface is it? Well, the idea, actually you have seen it many times. Some of you might even live with one of these in their house. So this is R3. The idea is to take at a given point here a line orthogonal to the z-axis Okay, we, I take an orthogonal vector, for example, of norm 1, otherwise just to fix, I mean, it's irrelevant which norm it has. And then I pick the whole line in this direction. So in particular, it has to be a surface covered by lines. And then I take the object. So then as I move this point, I would like this vector to rotate at uniform speed. Okay, so if I take as a parameter the height of the point, I would like at the same time, so if I move this height, I would like this vector to change at a uniform speed in the ortho always in the orthogonal direction to the z-axis. Okay. How can I get an explicit formula for an explicit parameterization for something like this? Well, that's not too difficult. Look at this. So you take x of uv. Uh, let me remember now. So the height, so it will have three components. The third one is kind of the parameter of, the, of z. Okay, so it's what I would like to call the speed of this special point. Okay, so let me call it a u for some given number a non-zero. Okay, pick a non-zero number and u is exactly the movement of this point there. As, for example, what I could take here, I could take cos, cos here, cos u, sine u. So what is this point? Which point is it? So at the point given by, let's say, forget, suppose a is equal to 1. I take the point at height u, and then I take the point, the vector, cos u, sine u. Okay, which is exactly a vector orthogonal to the z-axis of norm 1. Why do I like this expression? Because as when u moves, this is actually describing a rotation at uniform speed in the circle. Okay? So this becomes the angular momentum no, of this vector. Okay? But now this, this would be a curve. In fact, this is the helix one helix, okay? Now basically for every point of this helix, 
I want to take the whole line. So now I have to use the second parameter, which is V. I mean, this is not a surface, of course. It depends only on U. It's a curve. But I want to, which, which line do I want to take? The line, pass, the line passing through this point with this velocity. Well, that's easy. OK? So for v equal to 1 is exactly this point here. For v equal to 0 is exactly this point here. And then it's linear. I'm picking all points on this line. So why do I say that you should be very familiar with this surface? So now if you want to draw the surface, this becomes a bit more complicated. So I've printed, well, this is a helicoid. Oh, so you imagine you have this line, straight line, which rotates when you go up or down. I mean, here there is no problem in going down. Okay. So this keeps on rotating. Or if you want a nicer picture, but it's less clear, it's something like this. OK? OK, so this is, you should be familiar with this. I mean, certainly you have seen it many times because, for example, stairs, no? Round, I mean, circular sphere, stairs are built out of this. OK? You, you discretize this and you made stairs going up. OK? OK, so now. So I don't draw it, OK? Keep, keep that, those pictures in mind. Well, the first problem is, is it a regular surface or not? Because now I've given it as, a, as the image of this map. But now it's not clear in principle that this map satisfies all the properties required by the definition of a regular surface. OK, simple. Five minutes and you do it, OK? So it is a regular surface. It is automatically, so actually, where, where U and V lie? Well, V is the parameter on the line. So V lies in R, the whole R. U lies in R2, OK? Because you want Z to be free to go up and down over the whole Z axis, OK? Now, <clears throat> so you can check in five minutes that this is a regular surface. It has the nice feature of being covered by one chart, OK, by construction. So let's see the machine. What, what is the machine telling us now? Again, now you switch off the brain. I have x, xu. xu is minus v sin u, v cos u. A, xv is equal cos u sin u 0. Then x u u, it's minus v cos u minus v sin u 0. x u v, x u v, for example. Let's take this one. So it's minus sin u cos u. 0. XVV is 0, which is OK because it's linear in V. OK, if I take two derivatives in V. OK, then what else? N, normal vector. N, I pick, again, the standard choice. XU cross XV divided by its norm. So instead of writing N, let me write immediately uh, minus, uh, let me make the, 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 the wedge product, minus v sin u, v cos u a, and on the other line I have to put cos u sin u 0. So well, how much is this wedge product? Okay, so this becomes 0 minus a sin u, then here, 0 minus a cos u with the minus, so plus a cos u. Third component, minus v sine squared minus v cos squared, so minus v. OK, so then I can write n. The normal with my choice is exactly this one. 
I don't repeat it, but it's divided by its norm. And the norm is what? d squared plus d squared, it's a squared. a squared plus v squared under square root. OK? And now, let's start. OK, now we are back in business. E. E is the scalar product of this with itself. So it's v squared sine squared plus v squared cos squared. So it's v squared plus a squared. v squared plus a squared. F. F is the scalar product between these two. So it's minus v sine cos plus v sine cos. So 0 plus 0. F is 0. G is what? Is this times itself, so it's 1. Little, little letters, n scalar x u u. So besides the square root, we will remember about this at the end, it's minus a sine u, so it's a plus a v sine cos, OK? Minus, so plus, sorry, plus a v sine cos, minus a v sine cos. So they disappear, plus 0. So e is 0. Very good. Little f. Little f is this times this. So it's plus a sine squared plus a cos squared, so a plus 0. So it's a, but now I don't have to forget the denominator. So it's a divided by the square root of a squared plus v squared. And then little g. Little g is, well, it's 0 times something. Very nice. So modulo mistakes. Let's see. K at the point x of uv is how much? Is eg 0 minus f squared. So it's minus, if you, let's, minus a squared divided by a squared plus v squared. Divided, so times 1 over eg minus f squared. But eg minus f squared is another a squared plus v squared. OK? So this becomes just minus, well, choose the, the way you like it most, OK? For example, h, I can tell you, you substitute all these numbers. In this case, it's easy because there are plenty of zeros. Of course, when you, when you get the 0, you are very happy because, I mean, formula becomes much easier. Then in this case, h at the point of x u, little miracle, is constant equal to 0. Okay, we will talk about this kind of surfaces at some point. This is, this is a first, well, it's not the first example because the plane is another surface like this. Okay, but it's the, sec it's the first meaningful example of what is called the minimal surface. Okay. In this case, well, the only thing, the only conclusion, again, we can draw is what? Now, this surface, all, this, all the points of the surface have negative Gauss curvature. So the helicoid is completely covered by hyperbolic points. OK? Now, the point of this lecture is to be able to say this kind of conclusion just looking at the picture. Okay. I could have told you that this, the, the helicoid was made of hyperbolic points just by looking at the picture and also for the elliptic paraboloid we did before that they were elliptic points. There is, a, there is a simple way just by... So what is the difference between these two surfaces? Well, they have nothing in common, of course. But now, the, the, proper, the key property I want to stress 
is this one. On this surface, imagine that you pick a point and you draw the tangent plane at this point. Where is the surface? On one side. Okay? It's all on one side. So there is only one point where the two things touch, or which is, of course, the point where you are taking the tangent plane. And the whole surface lies on one side. Okay? Well, the key properties, of course, it's locally, but I mean, in this, it is true. Now, what if you do the same game here? Pick a point and draw the tangent plane at this point. Where does the surface lie? On both sides. It crosses. Okay, that's exactly the geometric property that characterizes elliptic points. Well, character almost characterizes. We will see there is one delicacy that we have to be careful about. But I mean, this is the key property which tells us, just by looking at the picture, which are possible and, I mean, usually elliptic or hyperbolic points. Okay? How do we do that? Well, <clears throat> we have to make one step further in our kind of analytic machinery. Given a function on a surface, we learn how to compute the differential of this function, and we, we spoke about critical points and regular values. This was all about first derivatives of a function at a given point. What about second derivatives? After all, if you give me a function on R2, and you ask me to look for minimum and maximum, I need second derivatives, okay, to distinguish between a minimum and a maximum point. I would like to do the same thing on a surface. Well, that's, now, S is a regular surface. Now, we pick a function with real values, okay? A differentiable function. I don't even say because otherwise it would be improper, impro impossible to do derivatives. Now I pick a critical point on S. So suppose that there is a critical point and I call it P. So P critical point for F. Okay? Now I would like to define the second derivative of the function. But of course, the surface is two-dimensional, so there is not anything like one second derivative. Even if the surface was the plane, you don't have one second derivative. You have a second derivative in one direction, second derivative in another direction, mixed second derivative. No? You have, in fact, you have a second derivative in some sense in any direction. Exactly. That's exactly what I want to. I give it this symbol, so this d squared at the point P, it has to take one direction and give me a number. So the second derivative in that direction. OK, so it, it should be a map from the tangent space to R. Doing what? Well, it has to take a tangent vector. Hence, I have at least one alpha such that alpha of t, alpha of 0 is equal to p, and alpha prime of 0 is equal to v. But then, the, it's obvious what I... I take f compose alpha, now it's a function of one variable t, and I take the second derivative. Now, this object, whatever it is, at the moment, we don't even know it's well defined. So, in any case, it's called Hessian of f at p. <clears throat> so now, immediately, we have to prove that this is a good definition. Okay? And actually, the philosophy is always the same. We are not really so. What is it, what, what is the problem is that in this formula, I have alpha. 
exactly as for the differential. Now it's slightly more complicated, but it's exactly the same problem. And we are going to solve it exactly in the same way. So we produce a formula for this object, quite complicated, but we don't care, in which alpha is not there. OK? How do we do it? So remember, that was exactly the philosophy for the differential. When we proved, we picked a local chart, and we said the differential of a map is the linear map which is associated with respect to the standard basis to the Jacobian. Okay? So we play the same game. It's just that we have to take two derivatives instead of one. So proposition, and in fact, let me list a few. And remember that we have this condition here. Eh? We are not taking any point. This is a definition given at a critical point. So, but let me repeat, let me stress it just for, if P is critical, <clears throat> some sense proposition zero is that the Hessian D squared F at P is well defined. And then we have also some properties. It is also a quadratic form. On TPS. Well, this is slightly an ambiguous statement. I mean, but it's clear what it means. Second, if P, because after all, it was a critical point. So now let's distinguish. If P is a, a local maximum, and in brackets, the other case, respect, respectively, minimum, then the action is, in the maximum case, is semi-definite negative in the maximum case and positive in the minimum case. Okay, And then exactly as we did in calculus for functions of more than one variable. Is the converse so true? No, not exactly. OK? So three, you have to put a stronger assumption to. So if d2 squared the action is strictly negative, is negative definite, negative. And of course, in the other case, positive, definite, then the converse holds. Then P is a local maximum, or in the other case, minimum. OK? This is exactly the same statement, and in fact, it will, you will see it's exactly the same proof as for functions of R2. Okay. So how do we prove it? Basically, we prove it at the same time, everything. We pick a chart. So take a chart around P. and give it a name, for example, to the point. There will be one point on the domain, u, which is sent to p via x. Okay. Suppose that this q, for example, this is just uh, q, will be a pair of numbers, corresponds to some pair of numbers a, b. <coughs> now, we have taken a, a curve, alpha, on the surface s. As usual, by picking its domain sufficiently small, we can assume that the image of alpha lies in the image of x. Okay? So, let me just say all these things by saying I pick alphas and epsilon such that 
uh, the image of alpha is contained in the image of x, okay? And then, exactly as we did for the differential, define beta to be the, the curve on u by pulling back alpha. Okay, now, it, now it's all. But then beta is a curve on a domain of R2. So beta will be given by a pair of functions, u of t, v of t. Okay? And the fantastic idea we used already for the differential was to write f composed alpha, which is the one we have to differentiate twice, of t as f composed x composed x inverse composed alpha. OK, that's exactly what we did last time, a few, few times ago. OK, so I want to see it as a composition of these two maps. And now I start taking derivatives. I mean, let me just, uh, so uh, under this notation, of course, this becomes f composed alpha, f composed x, composed beta. But beta, I've given names. OK, so this is f composed x at the point u of t, v of t. OK. I've given names to, the, to this to the components of this. So I use that. OK, so in fact, we should pick exactly the first part. After all, we have to compute the second derivative. To compute the second derivative, we need to compute first the first derivative, and then to take another one. So pick your nodes if you. So how much is f composed alpha d in dt but now I don't have to evaluate it at t equal to 0 because I'm going to take the second derivative. How much is this? Well, once I write it in that form, of course, that becomes uh, u prime. Since I, I'm not evaluating at, at 0, eh? so this will be functions of t now. Okay? But I don't write it. Otherwise, I need three blackboards. u prime times f composed x differentiated with respect to u plus v prime at, at the corresponding point, OK, by chain rule, plus v prime f composed x differentiated with respect to v. This is true at every point. Now I take the second derivative. And now, if I want, I can already evaluate at t equal to 0. This is what the definition of the Hessian is asking. So, so I need to take another derivative of this with respect to t. <coughs> OK, let's do it. This is a function of t. So this becomes u double prime. Now, if you want, you can put 0. but just to, I'm hoping to stay in one line. So it's u double prime f composed x with respect to u plus u prime times what? Times the derivative with respect to t of this. But then I have to apply again the chain rule because this will be a function of u of t, v of t. So this is u prime times u prime of f composed x u u plus v prime f composed x. In fact, there was no hope to stay in one line, u v. And this, is, that's it for this piece, OK? Then I have to play the same game here. So plus, plus v double prime f composed x v plus v prime times what? Same game u prime f composed x u v plus uh, v prime f composed x v v. OK. There is something I can group, not much. But 
you see, well, actually, the, in fact, OK. There is this term here, which is exactly this one. But that's it. That's the only thing that I can group. OK, you see? It's u prime v prime times f composed x uh, uv. So this will become, if you want, drop one and put here a two. Okay. But it's not a great improvement. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now what is the problem? If you understand the problem, you see me, then you would say that the proof is over. What is the problem? We wanted to find a formula for the Hessian where alpha did not appear. Where is alpha here? Well, everywhere. But the point is what of alpha is here? Now remember, everything here now is evaluated as 0. OK? When you evaluate this as 0, of course, here I get u prime at 0. Well, but that's OK. Because this does not really depend on alpha. It's, it's contained here in this bit of information. So when I see first derivative of the functions u and v, I'm OK. These objects here, do they depend on alpha? No. These are kind of intrinsic of the chart and the function. OK? So the partial derivatives of f composed x are OK in my spirit. So what is the problem? Well, the problem, so this, this observation tells me, look, this piece and this piece are OK. This piece would be OK and this piece would be OK. But here, there is u prime, u double prime. And here there is v double prime. Now, two different alpha passing through the same point and with the same velocity. Do they, have to, do they need to have the same second derivatives? No. The velocity at a given point cannot determine its acceleration at that point. The second derivative is independent of the first at the given point. Okay. So here is the problem. I can easily construct two different alpha with the same p and the same v and completely different v's. So why the theorem is true? Well, notice that up to now we haven't used anything. That's exactly the moment where this comes in. Critical, I mean, of course, I cannot prove that two given curves have the same thing. So the only way the theorem is true is that it's true because this is 0. OK, so I need to put, but, but that's exactly, I know that at critical point, f composed x at u is equal, f composed x v is equal to 0 at p. OK, at the point corresponding to P, if you want, because at Q here. At uh, everything here is evaluated. I, I've given names. So at the point A, B. Because I'm actually translating everything back to the domain of R2. OK. So if P is critical, these first derivatives vanish. So then these objects are not there, and then that's it. Now, <clears throat> so now what is the output of this? If you want, it's good to, so the, we, we found also an interesting formula. So the action at the point P at V, if P is a critical point, we have a local expression in terms of a chart, which is just U prime squared it's also quite easy to remember. U prime squared f composed x u u at the point a b. Now let me be for once pedantic about where I'm computing what. Okay. 
and this is this, plus 2 u prime 0, v prime 0, f composed x at a, b, but this is differentiated with respect to u, v, plus, sorry, u prime squared. Okay, u prime squared times this, plus twice this, plus v prime 0 squared, f composed x, v, v at the point a, b. So you see, it's easy to remember, no? Because basically, it's a quadrat. Now, in fact, this formula proves essentially everything. Why? Is it a quadratic form? Well, yes, it is a quadratic form. Okay, in the in the entry v. Well, this in first, it's, it it proves it's well defined for what, everything we said up to now. It is a quadratic form. If I write this quadratic form in terms of the standard basis, I've already given you a matrix representation of this. It's the matrix given by f composed x u u. F, so on the, on the first line, f composed x u v. Then on the second line, f composed x u v again, symmetric. And then f composed x v v. But now, this is the matrix representation with respect to the standard basis. And I'm writing in terms of second, the second derivative, so the standard Hessian. This is the old Hessian of the function f composed x. Do you agree? So f was on a surface, but f composed x is on, a do, is on the domain of R2. So you can apply all the theorems you know. The mat Okay, the quadratic forms are the same. Basically, I'm telling you the quadratic form associated on, on the, for the function on the surface is the same thing as the quadratic, as the Hessian, the old Hessian, for the function f composed x on the domain of R2. Well, but then, all, then you know all these theorems. And these theorems are exactly the old ones. Okay? Of course, you need to translate P to Q, but then, of course, maximum, minimum, who cares? Okay. Something is a maximum on S if and only if it is a, if, if and only if Q is the maximum of F composed X, and so on. Okay. So everything is, is done in one shot. Okay. So this formula tells you immediately everything. Now, is this making us closer to understand a geometric interpretation of all, the, of all the curvatures that we introduced? Well, it's not clear yet. It will be clear after we make a couple of examples of computations of the action for a couple of interesting functions. Height function. Remember, this was one of the examples listed also for the differential. What are we doing? We have our surface, our surface S. We pick a point P naught. <coughs> And, uh, and we pick one plane, actually, for making my picture a bit OK. And we take a plane passing through P0, OK? Sorry, a plane. Uh, this is capital P, OK? A plane. Now, what was the height function as a function on S with respect to this plane? Well, the idea was simple. Just take, take a unit. A U, a unit normal to this plane, call it A, okay? 
So P, the plane capital P, is nothing but the orthogonal complement to a vector. And I'm at, now I assume that I've already picked a vector of norm 1. OK, there is no. So the point, what the definition of the height function was h. <coughs> h of, we call it h of p was nothing but p minus p naught scalar product a. Okay. Now, what was a, which were which were critical points for these functions? We gave a, a geometric characterization of those. So p is critic, p was critical if Essentially, the normal, remember, we, we, we wrote it in language, in English, OK? Saying, if the normal line through the point P passes through P0. But that's the same thing as saying that if N of P, since now I've picked the, the unitary normal to the plane, N of P has to be A or minus A. Suppose it's A, we don't care, OK? Up. If it was minus a, change a with minus a, OK? Minus a is, is, again, a unit normal to the plane p. So up to change of sign, this is OK. OK? Do you remember this? Now, compute the Hessian. So in fact, geometrically, in my picture, Suggesting a name, it's true. It's somewhere here. Okay, so the normal at this point should be exactly a. Okay, so this would be my point p. Now, how much is the action? This is the new, the new ingredient. So, how much is this? Well, it's the second derivative at t equal to zero of h composed alpha. I have an explicit expression for h. So alpha of t minus p naught scalar product with a. OK? So how much is the first derivative? a is a constant vector. p is a fixed point. The only thing which is moving is here. So the first derivative would be alpha prime at t scalar a. So the second derivative is alpha double prime. Now I evaluated 0, scalar a. OK? But a is the normal vector. Because p is a critical, I mean, this would be true at every point. But now I know that a is n of p. So this is alpha double prime, scalar product n of p. Why this reminds me of something? This is exactly what we found in Euler's theorem. OK? This is exactly what? This is, by Euler's theorem, the second fundamental form at the point P evaluated twice in the direction V. OK? So the action at the critical point of the height function gives you as quadratic form exactly the second fundamental form. Now, in particular, there is always, so this is true for any plane, p naught, and so on. But in particular, there is always one special plane to look at. If I, now I reverse the process. This, I was fixing here p naught and p and I was looking for a special point on P. Now, suppose I take a point here, and I want to construct all this picture based on this point. Basically, what I'm, tell I'm saying, this is my P now. And suppose I take P not equal to P, and I take as a, as a plane in R3 the tangent plane to this point. Of course, I can construct and height function on this. Why this is interesting? Well, because, of course, P is automatically 
P is always a critical point for this height functional. So I have automatically a nice critical point for the height function with P equal P naught and A equal N of P. Well, if you want, you can rely on by construction. No? P is critical if, in fact, this was an if and only if. Eh? Okay. Well, if I take the tangent plane, of course, the unitary normal will be the normal by definition of the normal vector. Okay? So in this case, this is obvious. And so it P is a critical point. Okay? Today I see you a bit, maybe I'm not particularly clear today, but I see you a bit uh, confused. Is it hard? I mean, is there some point you want to go through again? In any case, okay, so, so if I reverse somehow the process, I, feel I first fix the point on the surface and I construct the plane in a way that the point, the original point is a critical point for this height function, but see, this property was true for every height function. Okay, so in particular, it is true for this one. Okay. But then, this implies, without proof, that's what I hope you agree, the following theorem. One, if the Gauss curvature at some point is positive, meaning, i.e., the same thing, i.e., P is elliptic, Sorry, IE is a Latin form to say the same. Okay, you know Latin more than your Italian colleagues. Very good. <laughs> <clears throat> so if you take an elliptic point, then there exists, it's better to write it in English, there exists a neighbor. A neighborhood uh, of P in S, which lies on the same side of the, and let me say now in quotation marks, a fine tangent plane to S. At P. In fact, moreover, P is the only point of intersection. I stop here, but I mean of intersection between this affine tangent plane and the surface itself. So just one comment before commenting why this is true. What is the affine tangent plane? Remember, when we define the tangent plane, I mean, the tangent plane to a surface at, at any point is a vector space. So really, if we want to make some precise pictures, all these pictures are wrong, okay? So the vector space, it's really this one parallel transported to the origin. I mean, a vector space, uh, something, a two-plane which does not pass through the origin cannot be a vector space, okay? On the other hand, it's very convenient geometrically to draw, to always to draw TPS at P, okay? That's exactly the affine tangent plane. So it's the translation of the tangent plane to the point P. Okay. Okay. Well, let me write also part two, and then we make comments.
part two, the opposite. If k of p is negative, then, I mean, i.e. p is hyperbolic, then in every neighbor of p in S, there are points which lie on both sides of the affine tangent plane. Okay. Well, why this is true? And in fact, it's true now without a proof. You have already the proof. Because pick this point. Construct this special height function. The action of the ice of the height of this height function is the second fundamental form. So what does it mean that the Gauss curvature is positive? It's telling you exactly that the second fundamental form is strictly definite. Now here, there is the obvious indeterminacy between geometry and analysis, because depending on the choice of n, it will be positive or negative. Well, no. Yeah, OK. No, it doesn't matter. The point is, you fall exactly in the cases of the theorem we stated before about the Hessian of a function, where you know, so it was the last one. So the Hessian of this function is strictly negative or positive, depending on n. And that means that the function, the height function, has a maximum or a minimum depending on orientation. But that's exactly the geometric way, I mean, the analytic way to say that the surface lies. Of course, how much is the height function at the point P? If P is equal to P naught, it's zero. Okay? So at this point, it's zero, and suppose it has a maximum. Well, that means it's always negative. It's negative in a neighbor. I mean, of course, you cannot draw global conclusions. This is a local analysis, OK? But th there is a neighbor where the function has to be negative. But being the height function negative means exactly that if you draw the graph, it lies below. OK? But that's exactly what's written here. It lies on one side. And it's impossible that there exists uh, of course, if, if I go sufficiently away from this point, I don't know. But certainly, there is a small neighbor where there is no other point where the height function is 0, because it's a strict maximum. OK? You see why there is nothing to prove. And the same thing here. OK? And now. Exactly as, in the okay. exactly as in the case of functions of two variables. So remember, there is this kind of annoying gap between the two theorems about the Hessian of a function. No? If it's strictly positive, then you have a local minimum. If it's strictly negative, you have a local maximum. If you have a maximum or a minimum, it's not true that they are strictly something. They are semi-definite. So in all cases where there is semi-definite, you cannot draw analytic conclusions. And in fact, you cannot draw now. I'm, I'm going to show you examples to convince you that, in fact, you cannot even draw geometric conclusions. So the point is, would, is there a line 3 in this theorem starting? If k of p is equal to 0, then the surface does something? The answer is no. You see, k of p is equal to 0 is exactly for all this, for all we said today, 
the case where the, the determinant of the second fundamental form is zero, so it's semi-definite. Okay? Examples to convince you there is no, no such theorem with k with zero Gauss curvature. <clears throat> okay, so all the following examples are interesting because they are examples, but the point of this observation is there is no such theorem for k equal to p, k, k of p is equal to zero. Okay, how do I convince you that there is no such a theorem? Explicit examples. Well, remember that there are two types of points with zero Gauss curvature. Because essentially the second fundamental form could be identically zero in every direction, or it could be one eigenvalue equal to zero and the other non-zero. Okay, so planar and parabolic. So planar. So I want to show you that in fact you cannot, even if you distinguish these two cases, there is no theorem. Well, planar, of course, there is example one, which is the plane. So give me a surface with a planar point. Well, the plane, any point. What happens to this theorem? Well, in some sense, it's true that, well, okay, this is kind of delicate. I mean, if, you, if I take the plane the height function is, of course, identically zero. The height function based at the point of the plane is identically zero. Okay. But there is also an, exa an example like this. Take x of uv equal to uv. In fact, it's a graph. uv, and then you pick as a function u cubed minus 3 v squared u. I should have practiced before coming to this lecture to draw you a picture. And so I didn't, so now let me try. It's something like this, okay? Hmm, not too bad. Okay. And so on. So here you have curves going in these directions. Now, this has a famous name. It's called the monkey saddle. Okay. And what is the point that we are really interested in? x of p is equal x of 0, 0, which actually goes to 0, 0, 0. It's exactly this central point of the saddle. OK. OK, let's, let's, let's do the exercise. Okay. There is no time to move on to other things, so let's make these examples complete. Let's compute the Gauss curvature of this surface. Well, first, I should prove, I should argue that this is a surface. It's OK. It's a graph of a differentiable function. It's a polynomial, so there is no problem. It's covered by one chart, so whatever I'm going to say will hold at every point. I mean, at the corresponding point. I hit every point of the surface. So xu, 1, 0, 3u squared minus 3v squared xv, 0, 1, minus 6vu, xuu, 0, 0, 6u, xuv, 0, 0, xu, xuv, minus 6v, xvv is 0, 0 with respect to v. Minus 6u. 
Then what else? Normal vector. Okay, instead of test, so I've written, in fact, you start learning tricks about being quick. So write xu and xv one on top of the other order in a reasonable way so that you can make the wedge product automatically. So what is n? n will be 0, so minus this thing. So 3v squared minus 3u squared. Then, so this is 0, so I'm glad this is uh, 6 uh, vu, and then 1, divided by its norm that I don't care. It will be some function, okay? I will always indicate it by square root. And then, okay, then E, capital E. Capital E is this times this, so it's 1, well, actually, and again, now for you it's the second one, so it's a bit too early, but for a graph, how much is Eg minus F squared? We know it. Let's see again and check the previous example. So E is equal to 1 plus <coughs> 3u squared minus 3v squared squared. Uh, uh, this is E. F. F is equal to this mess. So in fact, okay, there is really no point, okay? E, F, and G, whatever functions they are, okay? Little e. Little e will be n scalar product this, okay? So it's 0, 0, 6u over the square root. F is minus 6v over the square root, and g is minus 6u over the square root. That's actually the only thing I care. I mean, I'm not trying to get the complete expression. So how much is k? Well, k is eg minus f squared, so it's minus 36 it's not really important, the function, because we have not computed the other one. So in any case, eg minus f squared minus 36u squared plus 36v squared divided by eg minus f squared that I don't know. So what, is, what was the only point I was interested in was x. So I was looking for a planar point. Did I find it? Well, for u equal to v equal to 0, of course, the corresponding point has curvature 0. So it's either planar or parabolic. And then I go back to the single coefficients. For u equal to v equal to 0, they are all 0. So p is a planar point. That actually is the only conclusion I wanted to draw. Otherwise, you write down the complete expressions, okay? It's a planar point, but if I draw the, in this case, actually, it's, uh, since the point is the origin, the affine tangent space and the tangent space are the same thing, okay? If I draw the affine tangent space, where does the surface lie? On both sides. Okay. In every neighbor, whatever neighbor, small neighbor I pick, there will be points where it's positive and points where it's negative. You can actually check it immediately here. Okay. Whatever small disk in UV you pick, this function is somewhere positive and somewhere negative. Okay. So this seems to tell you, look, the theorem could be, if you have a planar point, the surface cuts the tangent plane and stays on both sides. But you have the plane, and the plane does not do that. It's not true that the plane stays on both sides. So for planar points, end of story. Well, what about parabolic points? Well, what is the prototype you have of a parabolic point?
give me give me a hint. So here we had the plane, and then we had to construct something strange. Now, what, what is kind of the model of a parabolic point that we have seen? Well, on one hand, we have the cylinder. Okay? Every point of the cylinder is parabolic. because The Gauss curvature is 0, but it's not true that both principal curvatures are 0. Okay? So if you look at, the, at, at, at this example, you might say, ah, so the theorem could be as the same as for elliptic points. Because what happens here on the cylinder if you draw the tangent plane at a given point? Well, the surface actually lies on one side. Now, it's not true anymore that P is the only point of intersection. Because there is a whole line. But maybe that's the only part of the theorem which fails. No. Here is an example. <coughs> In this case, I leave you to as an exercise. So take the YZ plane. In the YZ plane, take the curve Z equal, so it's, it's a graph of a function. Z is equal to <clears throat> y cube okay where z so the part of this which lies for example z in minus 1 1 okay how does it look like well of course the graph of the function y cube is something like this okay and i'm taking exactly this part i i the part I've drew is the one I'm interested in, OK? Now, take this curve and rotate. So of course, for, z, for y, for z, I mean, z equal to 1 corresponds also to y equal to 1, OK? So this is the point 1, 1, OK? So draw this line here. So this is the z equal to 1 line in this plane and rotate this curve around this axis. And now I made a mistake in my blackboard because I have no space to rotate it, so I need to cancel this. So that means if I pick a point on this curve, I have to add the whole circle of this radius with this center. Now if I pick this point, this, is, this would be the center, and this would be the radius, or more or less something like this. OK? And so on. How do I draw it in one shot? Well, I draw the symmetric curve, if, I, if I'm able to do that, okay, which looks more or less like this. And then every point is rotated. OK? So for every point, in, I join. Now, the interesting part is this. OK? I, I don't like drawing with colors, but let's. So points on this curve here are more interesting than the others. So first observation. This surface, actually, my picture is slightly misleading. Because here there is a problem. Because actually, the curve itself looks a bit more like this. I mean, so when I rotate, I really get a, a cusp, a non-differentiable point. Okay? So in fact, that's why I'm taking the open part of this curve. So this point is not on my surface. Okay? Every other point, since it doesn't touch the axis of rotation, produce a regular surface. Okay? So it is a regular surface. And now the point is that all these points, so yellow points, are parabolic. Parabolic. <coughs> 
This is something you need to check. You need to find the parameterization of this, of this object here, okay? exercise. But that's the only way you know how to compute if something is parabolic or not. You, you pick a point, pick a find the chart around this point, and compute E, F, G, E, F, G, K, okay? second fundamental form, and so on. So you can detect whether the Gauss curvature is 0, and in, you will find 0, but you have also to say, to argue that it is 0 not because everything vanishes, but only one of the two curvature, principal curvature vanishes. OK, do that. And this, this, these two objects cannot go together in a theorem. In this case, the surface was on one side. And in this case, clearly, the surface cuts the tangent plane. Well, sorry, I drew after one hour and a half, you start getting a bit myself slow. Well, no, but it's OK. Yeah, no, the tang imagine the tangent plane of the picture, and the, it will cut the surface in every neighborhood. OK? No surprise. I mean, it's easy to construct examples of functions where the Hessian is semi-definite and it's the, fun the function, the original function, had not a minimum and a maximum. So it would have been very strange that the height function, so the only thing that we are doing is that we are taking, instead of any function, the height function of a surface on the tangent plane. So it's not particularly surprising, OK? But in any case, the moral of this lecture is clear. Show me a picture, and I can tell you with minor possibilities of mistake, OK, minor, there, there is some. But I'm almost able to tell you immediately which are the elliptic points, the hyperbolic points. I must be very unlucky, I mean, to get to, 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 I can make mistakes only at flat points, okay? Okay, that's it.